Uh, today we are continuing in this series that we've been in, uh, started last week, called Escalators. And if you're new with us, uh, it's a play on words. It's a series about dealing with emotional escalation. And so uh, I was uh, eating dinner with my parents this past week, and my dad told me a story that one of his friends told him uh, that week, a true story just happened that week, uh, about emotional escalation. My dad's friend said he was outside working around the house and he heard some gunshots, which, you know, if you're in the city, that might be concerning, but being out in the country, you know, we hear gunshots sometime and we hope they got uh, a big buck, you know, or we hope they got a turkey or whatever. But this, these gunshots were particularly close. And so he's like, what's going on? And so he started walking in the direction of the gunshots. And sure enough, across one of his fields, he could see his neighbor, and his neighbor was shooting as a gun. Now his neighbor was standing on his property, which was good, but the problem was he was shooting onto my dad's friend's property in his direction. And so my dad's friend was like, this is a problem, you know? So he starts walking across the field and he gets up there and he gets to where he can talk to his neighbor and his neighbor, before he can say anything, his neighbor thankfully stopped shooting, you know, and, and uh, said this to him. He said, you got a lot of nerve walking up to me down range of my rifle. And my dad's friend said, well, you got a lot of nerve using my property as your rifle range. And as you can imagine, things kind of escalated from there. I'm glad my dad's friend wasn't armed himself or we might be reading about uh, what happened uh, on the news or hearing about it on the news. Uh, but things escalated and my dad's friend said he had to tell him six different times I do not want you shooting your gun across my property. First of all, it's dangerous. Second of all, I don't want you to do it. And third of all, it's illegal. And I will call the police if you continue to do it. And so things escalated. And I heard that story this week and I just shook my head and I was like, oh my goodness. And then it kind of hit me that we all hear a story like that and we shake our heads, but isn't that what we do? so many times in our lives, in our relationships, that we stand on our own property, a place where we feel really justified, and we take shots across some lines that maybe we shouldn't cross at someone in our life, and things escalate. You know, they say good fences make good neighbors, and they say that for a reason. And so I wanna talk to you today about boundaries. Because if you find that you struggle in your relationships with other people, whether it's your marital relationship or with people at work or with your kids, or if you struggle personally uh, with a, a personal sin issue that maybe you fall into the same type of sin over and over, most of the time the reason is that healthy boundaries have not been established or they're not being respected boundaries are so important. So I want to talk to you today about boundaries in our lives. And I want to do it from the perspective of a guy in scripture named Jacob. Um, Jacob's story covers uh, quite a bit of the book of Genesis. And if you know his story, you know that he started out uh, not that great. In fact, life was kind of messy. Um, and, and a lot of that was his own fault because he made some bad decisions. He did some things he shouldn't have done. And in fact, his family gets so upset with him at one point, his own brother wants to kill him. And because of that, he has to flee the country. And he flees to this country in the north where he has some distant relatives. And while he's living there among his distant relatives, he meets a young lady that he absolutely falls head over heels for. And her name was Rachel. And he falls in love and he wants to marry Rachel. Now in those days, if you're gonna marry someone, the groom, the guy that wants to marry the girl has to pay the girl's father what was called a dowry. And a dowry was just like a sign of respect. It was a young man saying, I'm a man of means. You know, I, I got a job, right? And uh, I can marry your daughter and I wanna marry your daughter. And so I'm gonna pay you a certain amount of money or I'm gonna give you so many goats or so many sheep. And you would have had to pay this dowry. But Jacob's problem was that he did not have a job and he didn't have any money. And he's in fact living as a refugee in this foreign country. And so he goes to Rachel's father, his name was Laban. And he says, this is what I wanna do. He said, I wanna marry your daughter, but this is what I wanna do. I will work for you for seven years if you'll let me marry your daughter. 
And Laban, Rachel's dad, says, okay, sounds good. And they make an agreement. Now, how many of you dads of daughters wish it still kind of worked that way, right? <laughs> it's like, but now we have to pay for the wedding. See, we got to get back to these biblical values, guys. Got to get back to these biblical values. It ain't going to happen, all right? But uh, that's how it worked in those days. And so they made this agreement. Jacob began working for Laban, and he works the seven years. And ladies, you'll enjoy this part. There's even a little verse in there that says, the seven years just seemed like a few days to Jacob because of his great love for Rachel. And all the ladies are like, oh, you know? And so the seven years go by apparently quickly for, for Jacob. And, but the day comes, he's like, all right, it's been seven years. It's time. I, I, wanna, I wanna marry your daughter. And Laban says, okay. And so they have the wedding. They have the wedding night. And Jacob wakes up in the morning and it's not Rachel. It's her older, apparently uglier sister, Leah, whom Laban could not marry off. Now, if you're wondering how that happens, I'll just say two things really quick. The first one is they would wear a veil when they would get married so you could only see the eyes. And the second thing is, thank goodness for Thomas Edison. Can I get an amen so they could see what's going on on the wedding night, right? But... He didn't know, all right? And so they consummated the marriage. And in those days, you're married, all right? Divorce is not an option. There's no turning back. And so Jacob is ticked off, understandably, and he goes to his real stand-up father-in-law, you know, and says, what in the world have you done? I wanted Rachel, not Leah. And Laban, this is the excuse he offers. He says, well, in our culture, you see where we live, on our, on our property over here, how we do things is we never marry off the younger one. Rachel was younger before we marry off the older one. And so I had to give you Leah first. That was his excuse. And Jacob gets so ticked off and, and, and he says, well, I wanna marry Rachel. And Laban says, okay, you can marry Rachel too for another seven years of work. And Jacob really doesn't have a choice. And he says, fine, I'll do it, but I'm not waiting. I want her now and then I'll work for another seven years. And so Laban agrees. Now, before we go any further, that just kind of paints a picture of the type of family that Jacob just married into, okay? Now, all of our families are a little dysfunctional at some level, but Jacob's family puts the fun in dysfunctional, okay? Like nobody in here has got anything on, on this family. And so it's like that for 14 years. And after those 14 years, Jacob's not only married into this family, but he's working for his father-in-law. And so after 14 years, he says, I've had enough. I'm ready to leave. I'm going to go back to where I'm from. We're going to live down there. And Laban says, listen, don't leave. He goes, I know that God has been blessing me and my household because of you. And that's a word of encouragement for some of you here today who maybe maybe you were born into a really unhealthy family or maybe like Jacob, you kind of accidentally married into a really unhealthy family. It's a word of encouragement that God knows how to take care of his kids even when they're in the midst of some really unhealthy circumstances or relationships. And so God takes care of Jacob. He blesses him so much that he's blessing Laban's family. And Laban's like, please don't leave. And he says, I'll pay you whatever you want. The 14 years are over. I'll pay you whatever you want now. And Jacob goes, okay, I'll stay. Here's what I want. They were, they were sheep and goat farmers. And so he said, whenever there's a sheep or goat that's born that has speckles or spots, it's mine. That's my payment. That's all I want. And any others, if they're solid, color streaked, whatever, you can have those. And Laban says, okay, that sounds fair. Now, knowing Laban's character, there probably weren't that many speckled or spotted sheep at that time. But what happens is God literally has favor on Jacob's life and all the sheep that are being born, God calls us to be speckled or spotted. And so over the course of another six years, Laban notices this and he's getting upset because you know all of his uh, resources are becoming owned by Jacob, his son-in-law. And so 10 different times over six years, he changes his wages. He's like, eh, I know we said speckled or spotted, but now I want you to have the solid colored ones. But the problem was for Laban, whenever he changed it, God would just change and cause those, those sheep to be born. And so over the course of six years, God makes Jacob a very, very wealthy man and Laban's wealth begins to decrease. 
and Jacob is working for Laban. And so Laban gets very upset and Jacob notices that he's not liking this very much. And then finally God says to Jacob, you can leave. It's time to go. Go back to where you're from. And so at this point, you would think that Jacob would sit down, have a nice conversation, tell him what's going to happen. They're going to leave, but he doesn't. Instead, he gets his wives and his families. He says, hey guys, we're leaving. We're moving back where I'm from to live with among my parents and everything. Um, We're leaving tonight, so get everything ready. And in the middle of the night, they all just up and leave without saying a word to Laban. So you can imagine Laban gets up the next day not only is his best employee gone without any notice, forget two weeks notice, he just doesn't show up one day and he's gone. He's like gone, gone, right? And, uh, and so he's upset, but his daughters are gone. His grandkids are gone. And so he's a little ticked off and he gets a band of men with weapons and, and they take off after them because he's gonna thinking, you know, I'm gonna take back what's mine. And so he pursues them and eventually he catches up with them. And when he catches up, things escalate and they get into this argument, this conversation. But I wanna show you what they do in the midst of this conversation because it helps to de-escalate their relationship and de-escalate the situation. It's in Genesis 31, we'll start in verse 36. It says, Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is my crime? He asked Laban. How have I wronged you that you hunt me down? I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for the 20 years I was in your household. So finally, after 20 years of basically hating life in Laban's household, not only living among him, but working for him, Jacob is finally honest with him about what it was like for the first time in 20 years. I might simply suggest at this point that maybe this conversation was about 20 years overdue. Jacob goes on and continues to vent and he says, I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely have sent me away empty handed. Now that's his perspective on the whole situation. But how many of you know, there's always two sides to every story. And so Laban responds, says, then Laban answered Jacob, the daughters are my daughters. The sons, my sons, and the flocks are my flocks. Everything you see is mine. In other words, he's saying, boy, you ain't got nothing without me. Those are my daughters you married. Your kids come from my daughters and all your sheep and goats came from my flocks. If it weren't for me, you wouldn't have nothing. And yet he realizes there's not really much he can do about it. He says, but what can I do today for these daughters of mine over the children they have born? And so maybe for the first time in his life, Laban does something really wise. He decides to draw a boundary. He says, come now, let us make a covenant, you and I. Let it be a witness between the two of us. A covenant back in those days was a a promise or an agreement. It was also like a contract, but in their day and age, they didn't have pen and paper. They didn't get with lawyers and each have a copy and write it all out and say, you know, that's what we do in our day and age. So if we make an agreement, we both agree to it. And that way, if you do something against or or cross the boundary that we set up, I've got this to prove it and you've got yours to prove it. But in this day and age, they didn't have that. They didn't do that. Instead, they do what Jacob does next. It says, so Jacob picked out a stone and he set it up as a marker. This would have been a very large stone, a very large rock, probably several, several people would have, it would have taken several people to lift it up, to move it. And he sets it up as a marker. And as you're gonna see here in a minute, this is a boundary marker. But what's interesting is it marks not only property lines, but also relational lines. He sets it up and it says, Jacob said to his relatives, gather stones. And they took stones and made a mound and they ate there by the mound. Then Laban said, this mound is a witness between you and me. And he's saying, here's what we're agreeing to. 
If you mistreat my daughters or take other wives, though no one is with us, understand that God will be a witness between you and me, right? Like every good parent learns how to say to their children, Laban says to Jacob, hey, listen, you might try to do some shady stuff when I'm not around, but God is watching you, right? Any of you parents bless your kids with that? Like, hey, remember, Jesus is always with you. He's always with you, right? God is watching you. God is watching. And that's what he's saying to Jacob. He's like, I'm not going to be there, but God is my witness. This is what we're agreeing to. You are not to mistreat my daughters or marry other people. You stay committed to them, all right? Don't mistreat them. Then he says this. Look at this mound and the marker I've set up between you and me. This mound is a witness and the marker is a witness that I will not pass beyond this mound to you and you will not pass beyond this mound and this marker to do me harm. So Laban does something very wise here and they both agree to it. They say, man, our relationship is really unhealthy and things are escalating. We need a boundary. And yes, that boundary separated property. It separated uh, a, a, a physical line so that he's saying, listen, Jacob, I don't want you coming up here to hurt me. And listen, I won't come down there to hurt you. But what blows me away is it's also relational. He's saying, here's the terms of our relationship. I want you to take care of my daughters. I want you in your personal integrity to have boundaries in your own heart so that you will take care of my daughters and of my grandkids. And they both agree to this. And here's why. I think they both came to this realization that we all need to come to today. That we absolutely need healthy boundaries in order to keep us from harm. We need healthy boundaries in all of our relationships. Every relationship we have, we need healthy boundaries to keep us from harm. And we need healthy boundaries in our own hearts and minds to keep us from harm. What do I mean when I talk about healthy boundaries? What I'm talking about is clarifying expectations. Clarifying expectations. When you set boundaries in your relationships or in your, in your own heart or in your own mind, what you are doing is you're clarifying expectations, okay? So, so think about it this way. Um, whenever you struggle in relationships, whether it's spouse, at work, with your kids, or, 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 or when you're struggling in your own personal integrity, it's almost always because boundaries haven't been established or, or respected. In other words, you have expectations. It's almost always because expectations are not being met, okay? So, so think about this. You're going to get married, okay? And you're so excited. And you have expectations of what that marriage is going to be like. But then you get married and after about three weeks, you realize this is not going to be what I expected. This person is not, you know, living with them is a little different than going on a date with them, right? Maybe you're a husband and you have an expectation that your pretty little wife is going to wash all your dishes and clean all your clothes. And she's going to, I know she's got a degree, but she's going to stay home with all the little babies and just raise them up. And uh, it's just going to be great. And when I get home from work, I am done working. And she's probably going to give me a foot massage every evening too, on top of it all. And she's going to love it. She's going to be like, this is what I was born to do. <laughs> Right? And then you get married. And she's like, "Uh, I plan on using my degree. You tried staying at home 12 hours a day with these kids, right? I want to go work, you know? I'm ambitious. I got goals. And you can do your own laundry, do your own dishes, and you can forget about the foot massage, right? And so your expectations aren't met. It causes things to escalate. Or how, how about maybe in your job? Your boss calls you in and he rips you a new one and tells you his expectations aren't being met and and things escalate because you're like, I didn't even know those were expectations. What are you talking about, right? Expectations going unmet causes things to escalate. Or how, I don't even have to mention parents with kids. Our expectations go unmet almost every single day of our lives, right? And things escalate, right? When, When expectations aren't being met, causes things to escalate. And when you find yourself in those situations, 
it's time for what I call a tough conversation. It's time for a tough conversation. You need, like Jacob and Laban here, to have a boundary setting conversation where the expectations are clarified. So everybody's on the same page. This is how this is gonna work. And here's the thing, and here's what you have to understand today. Boundary setting conversations are rarely easy, but they're desperately needed. And listen, you need to understand that because this right here is the reason that we avoid these conversations so much. Because they're not easy and we know they're not easy. So we avoid them. They're rarely easy, but they're desperately needed. That's why I call them a tough conversation. And listen, I don't call it a tough conversation because you act tough and you be mean and you give them a piece of your mind and you tell them how it is and you tell them how they screwed up. Because if you do it that way, you're only going to escalate the situation and make it worse. The Bible says even when you rebuke somebody, you need to do it with gentleness and respect and kindness. And so when I say have a tough conversation, I don't mean act tough. I just mean it's not an easy conversation to have. But listen, these conversations are desperately needed in all of our relationships in our lives. Parents, I'm convinced that parents need to have way more tough conversations with their kids where they clarify expectations. And you need to do it way before you think you need to do it. For example, my oldest daughter, I have four kids, two girls. My oldest daughter is 10 years old. Already, my wife and I have had several little conversations with her about dating mainly how she's not going to, okay? <laughs> now, you laugh, but we talk about with her all the time. Now listen, we're not gonna date or do the boyfriend-girlfriend thing until college, until college. Hey, listen, you laugh, but I'm dead serious because dating is for marriage. Why, why do you need to get married in high school? You're too young to get married in high school. There's no reason to date in high school. There's no reason for it. She's 10 and we're already having these conversations. Now, some of the grizzled veterans, as I call them, the parents of teenagers, you might be sitting there thinking, good luck with that one. <laughs> Let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> never going to work. I've heard that. And I would just say, yeah, it won't work if you never have the conversations and if you don't do it earlier than you think you need to. And if you don't cast the vision of why you're setting the boundary. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, the people cast off restraint. In other words, vision is the why. If your kids don't know why you're drawing a boundary, they will cast off restraint, they'll rebel. Think about it, we all do this. If we don't know why our boss wants us to do something, we don't wanna do it. Seems like mindless, you know, busy work. I don't wanna do this. Without a vision, people cast off restraint. Parents, it's so important whenever you draw a boundary for your kids, you need to be giving them the why. Cast the vision. We're already talking to our 10-year-old about, you know why we're doing this, this dating thing, the way we're doing it? Because we want you to meet the man of your dreams. We want you to fall in love. We want you to have an awesome dating relationship. We want you to marry him and have an awesome marriage the rest of your life. But you just need to trust mommy and daddy, honey, that a lot of times if you date before you're ready, a lot of really, really bad things can happen and then you don't even end up with that person and then you have all this baggage and it just hurts. And listen, we love you so much. We just wanna protect you from all that. Do you understand? And listen, she may not even be able to understand, but we're trying to have the conversation even before we need to have it so that she's ready. And so parents, you gotta have way more tough conversations where you set clear boundaries for your kids and you cast the vision of why you're doing that. I'm so blown away how many parents I sit with whose kids do things that the parents don't expect them to do and they get into trouble. And then I ask them, well, have you ever set those boundaries? Have you ever sat down and explicitly said to them, you know, don't do these things, do these things. And I'm amazed how many times parents have never even had the conversation. Well, they should know you shouldn't do drugs or drink or go to parties like that. Everybody knows that. Apparently not. Like, have you sat down and had that conversation? And parents, listen, a lot of times 
if you wait until it's, it's I won't say too late because God can redeem anything, but um, if you wait until after they're doing something that you don't want them to do, like if you wait until she starts dating the guy you don't like, and then you say, oh, new rule, family meeting, new rule, uh, no dating till college, no more. Like, good luck with that. That's not gonna go well. That's gonna escalate things. You gotta start earlier than you need to. And so parents, we gotta have more tough conversations with our kids. Uh, bosses, if there's any bosses in the room, if you have people that work for you, you've really got to do a good job of clarifying expectations for people. Because sometimes people aren't doing what you expect and you're getting upset, but you really need to ask yourself, have you made it clear to them that it, that is what you expect? Or when you hired them, was it, you know, well, here's the job, you do this, talk to you later, right? You got to spell it out. You got to be specific. And so don't just fire someone have a meeting, sit down, boundary setting, tough conversation. And listen, be honest with them. Listen, uh, here's my expectations. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear from the beginning, but here's what I want you to do. And you haven't been doing it, which, you know, if that's my fault, I apologize, but I'm, I'm making you aware now. And so we're gonna give you whatever it is based on your job. Maybe it's a month, maybe three months, six months. We're gonna give you some time and I want you to start doing these things. And I believe in you, you can do it, all right? Cool, awesome. And if you're a Christian boss, let me pray for you before you leave. You can do that in your job if, if, if it's your job. You know, if you own the business, you can do whatever you want, right? And so listen, do that. And then if they don't meet the expectations, then have the next tough conversation where you set them free to go find God's will for your life because it's obviously not working for you, right? Okay? And that's okay too. Sometimes that needs to happen. But, but make sure that the expectations are clear. And listen, it works in reverse. Employees. If your job is not meeting the expectations, you need to talk to your boss about that. They might not be aware that they told you one thing and now they're asking you another thing. You need to make them aware. You need to have a tough conversation. I, I've talked to several people, two or three people over the last few years who are dissatisfied with their salary. And we talked to them, I was like, well, man, talk to your boss about it. And they actually got a raise after talking to their boss, right? because they had that tough conversation. But a lot of people shy away from those tough conversations because we assume it's gonna go badly, right? And so we gotta have more boundary setting conversations. Spouses in your marriage, if your marriage is not meeting your expectations on a consistent basis, it's time for a tough conversation with your spouse. And if you want that to go well, I, I suggest that you ask each other three questions. In fact, you should ask each other these three questions very frequently, if not weekly, uh, at least monthly. I, I've lost count how many times my wife and I have asked e each other these three questions. First of all, um, is there anything I do ongoing, anything I do or have done in the past to make you feel disrespected or unloved? Is there anything I do or have done to make you feel disrespected or unloved? Like, fellas, if she's just giving you the cold shoulder, I don't care if she says she's fine, all right, she's not fine, okay? So sit down and ask her this. And listen, whatever she says, listen, just nod and this is what you say, I'm sorry, okay? Do it, can we practice that, fellas? Can you do that way? I'm sorry, yeah. No matter what she says, do not justify, don't explain. Well, I just said that because you did this. No, all right? <laughs> Escalator to crazy town, okay? Don't want that to happen. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry, okay? Ladies, vice versa. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I did that, or I realized I did that. I'm sorry. I won't do that again. I'm sorry. Next question. What can I do proactively to help you feel loved and supported? What can I do to help you feel loved and supported? And lastly, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? If you sense there's tension, start with the first question. Maybe things are going great or you think they're going great. Just start with the second question. How, how can I help you feel loved and supported? How can I pray for you? We need to have more of these conversations in our marriage, these boundary setting conversations. And guys, fellas, I'm trying to help you out here. Listen, if you go home today and you're like, hey, honey, you know, preacher talked about this. Let's have one of those conversations, right? You'll be being proactive You'll help clarify the relationship. You'll help her expectations get met. And you're going to score some major points, okay? <laughs> She'll be like, mm, my man, he's a man of God. He just, mm. We go to church. I, think, I thought he was playing on his phone, but he listened today. 
Mm. Points on the scoreboard, guys. That's all I'm saying, all right? Score major points. If you're proactive about it, don't wait until she's upset with you. Be proactive, okay? That's just a freebie, all right? But listen, listen, we got to have more boundary-setting conversations. You know, Jesus talked about this. He said it this way in Matthew 18, verse 15. He said, if your brother sins against you, go and confront him privately. If he listens to you, then you have won your brother over. Isn't that awesome? You know, you know why we don't have boundary setting conversations so often? It's because they're tough. And, and you know why? We imagine they're going to go poorly. It's like, oh, I'm not walking into that water. Like, this is going to go badly. Hey, listen, what if it went well? What if it changed things? What if the rest of your life, that relationship is different and awesome because you had the courage to have a boundary setting conversation and you clarified expectations? What if you win them over? Or what if you find you've been doing things unintentionally and you change and, and everything's different? Why do we always assume it's going to go badly? But listen, regardless, they're just tough conversations, aren't they? Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and confront him confrontation is never fun. It's not fun. There, there, I hate com confrontation, you know? And it's just because I, I'm a gracious, kind person and I just, I just hate to confront people. Now, I've talked to some people who are like, I don't mind it, I'll do it, right? <laughs> there are some people who don't mind confrontation. There are some people who are like, yeah, let's have these boundary setting conversations. And listen, those are the people who need to be really careful because you can enter into it and you can act in ways that aren't consistent with scripture. And you can act in ways that Jesus doesn't want you to act. And you can step all over people's feelings. The Bible says if you have these conversations, do, do it with gentleness and respect. And listen, somebody told me this about myself and my own personality, and I wanna bless some of you who hate confrontation in your life. Some of you people out there who are so meek and mild, and you're like, oh, I don't know how they're gonna take this. I'm so worried. Listen, when it comes from you, it will, it will be so effective. It'll be more effective than when it comes from somebody who enjoys the confrontation. Because it, when it comes from you, first of all, you never hardly ever say anything. So when you say something, they're gonna listen. But secondly, you'll say it with such love that they'll know it's coming from a place of love and they'll actually listen and they'll actually change a lot of the time. And somebody blessed that with me and said, so Aaron, don't, don't shy down. People will receive it from you because they know that it's coming from a place of love. But listen, we've got to learn to have these tough conversations. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, this word brother here is just a general term. It just means, you know, be like if I said, you know, if anybody sins against you, if somebody sins against you. And so let me make it really personal for you today. If your child sins against you, go and confront them privately. Privately's a key here in any relationship, in any circumstance. The Bible says, go to them one-on-one. -on -one. Then it goes on to say, if they don't listen, bring in somebody else. And then if they don't listen, you know, tell everybody, you know, like then deal with it on a more public level. But go to them, go to them privately. If your child sins against you, if your coworker sins against you, go and confront them privately. Maybe you don't need to tell the boss yet. Maybe you don't need to tell everybody else yet. That's called gossip. It'll only make things worse. Go to them privately and say, hey, listen, we haven't been seeing eye to eye. Let's talk about this. Let's set some boundaries. Let's, let's clarify some expectations of how this is gonna work. How about this? If your spouse sins against you, go and confront them privately. The word confront, the word sin there, they're very strong words, but sometimes we need to have these conversations when, when nobody's really sinned. It's just the expectations aren't clear and people are stepping over people's boundaries. And, and so there's just tension and frustration building and, and nobody's really done anything terribly wrong. It's just, we need to really talk and clarify expectations. And listen, these conversations are rarely easy, but they're desperately, desperately needed. And that's why God has them so much in his word. You ever notice like most of the Bible is like a boundary setting conversation from God to us. Uh, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. I want you to do this. Don't do this, don't do this, don't. right? And then what does he say? 
he gives us stern consequences. Like if you do these things, like you could spend eternity separated from me. I mean, most of the Bible is a boundary setting conversation. And that's what has led so many people who don't understand God's heart to assume he's like some cosmic killjoy. Like he just doesn't want me to have fun, you know? He, he, just, he just wants me to be miserable. He's got all these rules and all these warnings seem so unloving. Listen, God doesn't draw all these boundaries because he's a cosmic killjoy. God call, draws all these boundaries for us because he's a loving father and he wants to keep us from harm and he created us. He knows how we work as individuals and he knows how relationships work better than anybody. And so he's drawn boundaries for us and he's warned us of what will happen if we cross those boundaries. We live uh, several miles south of Mount Orb, closer to Russellville and off of a back road and a country lane. And it's a beautiful house. Uh, we love living there, kind of out in the country. And we have two acres uh, that we live on and it's absolutely beautiful. And, and maybe the best part is like, there's a, a farmer next door who owns like almost 200 acres all around us. And so there's just fields all around us. And I love it when the FedEx guys come up and they get out and they're like, this place is beautiful. How much land do you own? And I'm like, uh, two acres, you know, like, like see that fenced in part and this part, that's mine. And then everything else is the next guys. Uh, but we love living there because of all the space. It's a very spacious place. And my kids love playing out in the yard. And I love that they love playing out in the yard. But several times now, I've pulled them in for a boundary setting conversation. And I go, hey guys, you can play wherever you want today. It's a beautiful day. But listen, see that piece of ground over there that's flat and black and smooth? That's called a road. You're not allowed to play on the road because you could die, right? <laughs> Capiche? Have fun, right? Like those are the conversations, right? And, and listen, I literally have had that conversation. I've literally told them, don't play on the road because you could die, guys. You could die. Literally have drawn that strong of a boundary. Now listen, would you call me an evil, unloving father? Because I've been so stern with my kids and I've drawn such a strong boundary for them and I've warned them of the devastating consequences of what could happen if they ignore the boundary I've drawn? No, in fact, it shows I'm the opposite, that I actually love them deeply and I wanna keep them from harm. And God is the same way. And, and it grieves my heart that so many people in our culture read these stern warnings and think he's so mean and evil. And how could he say that? When in fact, it's the opposite. And he's saying, no, I love you. I wanna keep you from harm. I'm gonna draw these boundaries for, for, for you. And I pray and I pray and I pray that you listen and that you respect the boundaries that I've drawn. There was one day, probably over a year ago, my kids were out playing in our front yard and uh, it's pretty large. They were, they were uh, you know, riding around in those little uh, power wheel things. We got two of them, you know, people like gave them to us, you know, they're, you're used. And, you know, I think they're kind of lame because they don't go that fast, you know. When I was a kid, we had like this thing called a Honda Odyssey. It was like a, a go-kart on steroids thing would go like 50 miles an hour, you know. I'm like a seven-year-old. I'm like, whoa! you know, flying through a field. It had a roll bar, you know, um, you know, pretty much flipped it a few times. You know, that's what I'm talking about. And my kids are like, wee, daddy. And I'm like, yeah, you're really cruising there, kid, you know. <laughs> and so this one day they're out there playing in their little power wheels, having a good time. And I was going to go in for a few minutes. And it dawned on me that I told them many times, don't go on the road. And they knew that, but I had this thought and the thought, it was a troubling thought. <laughs> and the thought was, man, what if they got some of me in them? Because I'm one of those people where, you know, if this is the road boundary, it's like you draw a boundary, like don't go over there. I'm like, why? Why? What's gonna happen? What happens when you go over there? Huh? Huh? Woo. Woo. Now what? What are you gonna do now? Right? What happened? Nothing happened. See? Woo! You know? And it kind of freaked me out. I'm like, what if they got some of me in them, you know? And what if, what if they're like, well, he said not to go on the road, you know? but I can get as close to the road as I want, you know, because it troubled me because 
there's farmers around and they got big machinery and some of those plows hang off of the road a good five feet. And I thought they can be driving the power wheel like, well, I'm not on the road, ah, you know, <laughs> cream, you know. And, uh, and I was like, man, it kind of dawned on me. And so I'm looking around the yard and I see a tree about halfway down our driveway. I said, guys, you know how you're not allowed to go on the road? And they're like, yeah. I was like, listen, today, new rule. Okay, you guys listening? You can't go past the tree anymore. And they were kind of like, why? Dad, eh, you know, you just cut our space, you know, down by this much. Uh, it's like, listen, listen. And I cast the vision. I told them why. They're like, oh, okay, we get it. Okay, we'll listen. We won't go past the tree. And they didn't. It was great. It's great. I'm convinced when it comes to our personal integrity, we need to draw the boundary further back. Like, why do we play these games so many times in our relationship with God? or in our own personal integrity. It's like, well, I wanna see how close I can get to this sin and, in, and maybe get some pleasure from it without actually, oh, I'm not technically standing on the road, I've just got one toe on it. Why do we wanna see how close we can get to the boundary without actually crossing it? And then we wonder why we're so miserable. And I wonder if it's because we're too Christian to enjoy sin or too sinful to enjoy Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm done playing that game. I, I want to stay cl as close to my heavenly father's heart as possible. That's what I want to do. And so maybe, maybe the reason that you've struggled in some sin issue in your life is you've been playing that game. And what you need to do, God's drawn the boundary here, but in, the, in your own heart, for the sake of your own integrity, because you know you're a weak person who is tempted, you need to draw the boundary further back. In fact, Jesus talked about this principle. He said to the people he was teaching, he said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. That's, that was God's original boundary. I'm telling you, don't even look lustfully at a woman. Don't even look. And so if you struggle with looking, maybe you need to draw it even further back and say, hey, listen, I'm gonna set restrictions on my iPhone. You don't even have to download new software to do that. It'll do it itself. You go into your settings and restrictions, adult content, and you can restrict it and have a friend set a password that you don't know. And there, you've just drawn the boundary further back. Jesus said, don't even, don't even look. Just draw the boundary further back. So how about we don't just avoid getting drunk or smoking pot? How about we avoid the people and places where those things happen? We gotta draw the boundary further back. Don't just avoid premarital sex. How about avoid dating people that don't love Jesus because dating is for marriage. And how about if they do love Jesus, and so it's legal to date them, you just avoid places where you're in private together, one-on-one. -on -one. Because when you're in private together with someone you're attracted to, you're attracted to them. And it's, <laughs> it's more tempting to engage in premarital sex. We gotta draw the boundary further back. And married, married folks, listen, how about not don't commit adultery, right? How about we draw it further back than that? Maybe a boundary you need to draw in your marriage is, listen, hey, I'm not gonna have a one-on-one -on -one meeting or I'm not gonna have a lunch appointment with someone of the opposite sex, one-on-one. -on -one. That is a personal and professional boundary that we have here at church. That's self-imposed. <laughs> there's, no, there's no law when you start a church that says you have to do that. But that's something that my last pastor taught me and I'm like, that's a, that's a wise thing because I want to be above reproach and I want to stay far away from any hint of temptation. I want to guard my marriage and I'm going to take a step further back and I'm going to set the boundary further back. And so I don't have meetings with people of the opposite sex one-on-one, -on -one, period. I don't even pray with them unless we're in public and we're in church. And so if they want to meet for counseling, prayer, I'm like, hey, can your husband come along? Can my wife come along? Can another prayer team member come along? Because I won't do that one-on-one. -on -one. It's time to draw the boundary further back because I don't know about you, but 
I want to stay as close to my father's heart as possible because I know he has the boundaries for a good reason because he's a loving father and he wants what's best for me because we need boundaries to keep us from harm. Boundary conversations are rarely easy, but they're desperately, desperately needed. I want to close with this thought. I grew up singing an old hymn called Come Thou Fount. And it became one of my favorite hymns uh, of all the old ones we used to sing in church. And the reason it was my favorite is because I so identified with the second verse, which said this, O to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. A fetter was the handcuff part of a chain that kept you bound to something. And the hymn writer was saying, God, if that's what it takes, just handcuff me and keep me chained to your heart because I just don't want to stray too far from you. And then my favorite part because of its confessional nature and the honesty of it, and because I, I feel this so often, it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Our Father God, that's our prayer today, that you would take our hearts and you would bind them and yet you would seal them, Jesus. God, I pray for all of us in this room that you would help us see your boundaries for what they are, not harsh commands, but loving, compassionate concern from a father who loves us so much. God, I'm so thankful for your boundaries and your warnings that you've given us in scripture. God, I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross, who has paid for every person in this room any time we've ever crossed a boundary and hurt ourselves or hurt our relationship with you or hurt other people. Jesus, I'm so thankful today for your grace. And God, I pray that you would help us to take it, the initiative to draw the boundaries as far back as we need to go so that we can stay close to your heart. Father, we love you and we wanna honor you with our lives. So that's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.